Vasudevaya. So we're reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, text 27, uh, Canto 3, chapter 26, text 27. The name of the chapter is Fundamental Principles of Material Nature. Can we just, do I just chant without any response of this? Because no one else has a book. We, we fix now. We
So that super soul, I mean that intelligence is supposed to have control of the reins. But without control of the reins, then the reins are pulled by horses, senses. And they accept and reject things, which is what is being spoken of here. The mind accepts things which uh, it deems or it feels are beneficial to satisfying the desires of the senses. And it rejects those things which it feels are detrimental to the satisfaction of the senses. Not only that perception is not only ac always accurate. That the living entity, he sees things and he smells things and he hears things and he tastes things and he touches things. And some things he touches, he likes to touch. Some things he sees, he likes to see. Some things he tastes, he likes to taste. And other things are unfavorable. You see this very much when you deal with children because there's no mm, filters. You know, If they like it, they, they're very much in favor of it. And if they don't like it, they reject it right away. Um, but the living entity, he, the mind, it, it can be disturbed, it can be agitated by different things that come into the sensual perception. And we have this uh, material world here, out here in Atlanta and all over the place. And there's a, there's a, um, an occupation or a, an activity called advertising. Right? And advertising is specifically designed to agitate the mind. So that the mind will come to the conclusion that if you don't have this thing, then the senses won't be happy, you won't be happy, everybody will be miserable. So then the sign makes the mind makes a determination. It makes a determination to get that thing. I will get that thing no matter what I have to do. If if the person is in the mode of ignorance, then that thing he goes for will be very close. He won't have to make much endeavor. Because in the mode of ignorance, the mind doesn't have much determination, only a little bit of a term, determination. So then the mind will think, look for those things that are very close by, very easy to obtain, and will go for those things in the hope that those things will satisfy that craving that comes into the mind via the senses. The senses need something to be satisfied, and the mind will make an endeavor to get it. In the mode of passion, the mind is a little bit more <coughs> energetic. And so the mind will push the living entity to work very hard to achieve things, maybe lofty goals, material goals of uh, money and fame and power and all these things. And the mind will push the living entity to work, 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 run, 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 run. So you see outside so many things that are being uh, pushed forward as being necessities. Not just something you want, but they're needed. Right? You need this thing. You need to do it. You need to do it now. Not even, you can't even wait because they'll run out of it if you don't get it right now. Right? You need it. So the, the mind pushes. You need it. You need it. And then the mind agitates. Intelligence is weak. So the intelligence is not functioning. If the intelligence is functioning, the intelligence will analyze. Mind, you sure you want that thing? You sure you want that thing? Because if you go for that thing, then it may not be what it looks like. Huh? It may look very good, but then you get it and it's not going to satisfy you. Or it will get in the way of something else you want to achieve. For example, we have some college students. They're going to school. So in the University of Florida, which is right near um, Gainesville, where I often reside. Um, so at the University of Florida, half your time is spent studying and the other half of your time is spent partying. Right? And it's, it's kind of famous for that, that, or infamous for that, depending on your point of view. That the students, they spend a significant amount of their time trying to enjoy. Actually, students sometimes die because they're trying to enjoy so hard that they drink huge quantities of intoxication and they have competitions between them, who can drink more. And they think by drinking then we'll, we'll get very, we'll have a good time and they drink too much and they kill themselves. We see 21 year old, 22 year old people dying. And same thing in cars, right? Sometimes we get in a car, we want to show off our car, so we try to drive very fast and then we wind up smushed. No, no more body, body finish. So the intelligence, if the intelligence is strong, then when the mind says, let's party, the intelligence says, are you sure you really want to do that? We saw that the 
other person died, and besides you have a test tomorrow. If you try to enjoy today, tomorrow you'll suffer. You'll fail your exam, you won't get your degree, then you won't be able to become rich and famous in the future. So the mind, the mind and the intelligence have a debate, and if the intelligence is strong, then the mind will be subdued. But if the intelligence is weak, then the mind will win. And the mind only has this, the desires of the senses short term in its, in its purview. It's only thinking what will make my senses happy. It's not thinking of the ultimate welfare. What to speak of the ultimate, ultimate welfare. Because for the mind to consider the ultimate, ultimate welfare, the, the desire of the soul, the mind has to be controlled by the spiritual intelligence. Even the material intelligence isn't going to kick in there. The, spirit, the material intelligence is only looking for extended sense gratification, a higher level of sense gratification. You don't want to settle for that cheap junk car and a silly job pumping gas. You want to become a great doctor and be able to get a Mercedes. You know, so just postpone it for now, work very hard, go to school, become famous, rich, and then you'll be really have good sense gratification. You'll get a big house and you'll have a nice watch and you'll have a good wife and because money buys everything. And then you'll be very, very satisfied. But that's the material intelligence. And the spirit of, spiritual intelligence sees that this is just a cage. <laughs> this is a, just a cage. Why I should spend all my time decorating the cage, polishing the cage, when the bird inside is dying. The bird inside is needing something entirely different. So if the spiritual intelligence is strong, then when the material senses and mind are disturbed, the intelligence will be able to bring the mind back from wherever and when and ever it wanders, right? Bring it back under the control of the self. In this case, the, the strong spiritual intelligence. But if the spiritual intelligence is undeveloped or not strong enough, then the mind will be pulled. Pulled by the senses and pulled into problematic situations. Situations which will cause grief or, you know, it's described that in the mode of passion, it will cause grief. In the mode of ignorance, it will cause worse than that. It will cause great suffering, great suffering. And, and even in the mode of goodness, we find that we just wind up with some material satisfaction, but the ultimate goal of life is forgotten um, very often. Sometimes the mode of goodness clears the way and allows us to think things so that we can begin to perceive that there's something higher than material satisfaction. And we go for some kind of understanding of who we really are. What is the goal of human life? Who am I? What am I doing here? Why should I uh, settle for <coughs> material happiness, which is certified as Dukali on the Shashvatam, temporary and miserable, even at its best, right? Even if I have a wonderful marriage that lasts me for 50 years, still someone's going to die. Uh, somewhere along the line, one of us is going to be left alone. One of us, one of us is going to be sad. That, that's the ultimate goal, call, result of material happiness. The body will get sick and it will deteriorate and I won't be able to do the things that I used to do that caused me so much pleasure. And even though we hear this again and again, because the, the intelligence is weak, because the, especially the spiritual intelligence is weak, we settle for second best and we go for material sense gratification. It's described in, uh, in the second, can't, uh, second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Arjuna asked Krishna to describe someone who's really achieved some degree of uh, spiritual awareness, Sitaprakya, that the person who is Brahman realized is not influenced by the material senses at all. What is that person like? How does he walk? How does he talk? How does he sit? Tell me his qualification. And Krishna describes that how does he walk? Well, he uses all the senses in the service of the Lord. Um, because in the material world, we use our senses just to get some temporary pleasure. That's what the senses are there for. That's why we consider, that's why we want our eyes to see well, so we wear nice glasses, because there's so many beautiful things to see. And we want to hear well. Everybody's walking around with headphones in their ears, right? because they want to hear some particular sound that gives them particular pleasure. They want to hear that sound. They don't want to be distracted, so they want to absorb them. Even in talking to somebody, walking with somebody, everybody is plugged into their own sound. Mm -hmm. They're not listening to anybody else's sound. They just want to hear their own sound. 
And then, and then the, the, the touch, we want to touch soft things. We want to, we want to feel beautiful things. And we want to see gorgeous things. So we, we, we try to put our senses in places, even when we're in not places. What, what's so beautiful about downtown Atlanta? But we try to create an ambience, some kind of illusion of beauty. Um, so that our so eyes can be satisfied and our senses can be satisfied. But Krishna describes to Arjuna that the person who's got control of his mind and senses, he's not enamored by these things at all. And he just simply uses his senses in the service of the Lord. He's not looking for pleasure from the senses in contact with the sense objects. Rather, he's looking for pleasure um, in another place, in his relationship with Krishna. Or, in this particular case, Krishna is talking not necessarily about someone who's looking for Krishna, but at least looking beyond the material world to the spiritual realm on some level for their pleasure. They realize their pleasure won't come there. And then, how does he sit? How does he sit? Well, how does he sit means he doesn't let his senses, he doesn't allow his senses to just wander around indiscriminately. He keeps them. It, the, the, the analogy is given of a tortoise, that the tortoise pulls his limbs within the shell. When the tortoise doesn't use the limbs, the limbs are hidden in the shell. So that way, the, uh, he has control of them. He sends them out only when he wants to use them in Krishna's service or, or a good purpose. And when he doesn't want to use them, then he takes them so that they can't drag him uncooperatively. They, they can't get control and take it, take it away from him. So therefore, he draws his soul, he, his senses inside when they're not being used. And then the last one: How does he? How does he? Uh, how does he sit? How does he walk? And how does he talk? And this is very, very interesting because Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, well, he, what he does is he's not affected by dualities. He doesn't think that when someone tells him how great he is, that that person is very intelligent. Thank you very much. You finally realized my greatness. I knew it would take you some time, but finally you've achieved the, the realization necessary in order to make me happy in the material world. And he doesn't get upset when someone defames him. He's equal in happiness and distress and fame and infamy. He doesn't react strongly. He doesn't retaliate with his tongue. He doesn't. Uh, he isn't gratified and grateful when someone glorifies him, and he isn't retaliate when someone uh, vilifies him. So he's got control. Um, I was looking at, the, at this uh, transliteration of the word sankalpa. Sankalpa tra translated here as thoughts. But elsewhere, it's translated in different ways. And um, one of the ways, or two of the ways, is that it's translated as impressions. You know, our thoughts come from impressions, right? We see things in the material world and they make an impression on us. And from those impressions, we, um, we develop determination. That that's what's being said here in the verse. We, we, we get an impression of something and we think, I want that thing. And then we go for that thing. Or we think, I don't like that thing, right? But we have impressions. I used to live with a bunch of teenagers for many, many years. I lived with a bunch of teenagers. I traveled with a bunch of... Teenagers are balls of um, impressions and senses and a combination of the two of those things because the intelligence is still very weak. And so, you know, I love an eggplant. I hate zucchini. I, I, when we would talk about where we go when we travel, it would come down to, well, do you remember that strawberry ice cream that we had? Um, that we would travel to Vrindavan. We would travel to Mayapur. And we would go to Ramuna and all kinds of holy places, and the quintessence of the remembrance would be what we ate there. <laughs> what kind of prasad was served? Because the senses are so strong, and the impressions left by the satisfaction of the apparent satisfaction of the senses drives us to act. So these these impressions on the mind, these uh, grooves in the chitta. They make us uh, act in certain ways. Therefore, we have to be very, very careful about what impressions we allow into our mind. In the Vedic culture, 
There's sanskars. Now, that there's another meaning of sanskar, right? Or sankalpa. It comes from the same root as sankalpa. Is there are certain sanskars that mm, make impressions on us, and they're meant to make good impressions on us, so that we do the right thing, like the vivaha sanskar. If it, the vivaha sanskar is very complicated, it's something in a real uh, detailed Indian wedding. It may take as long as seven days with all the rituals that go through. By the end of it, you think, I'm really married. I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> right? And, and when, we, when we go to school, there's a samskar for all. And then we have garbhadam samskar when we want to conceive a child. There's some things we do so that our mind is brought into a proper consciousness, that our senses are not dictating our behavior, but our behavior is being governed by a higher goal, a higher mode of of nature at least, and even preferably beyond that, a, a, a desire to serve Krishna. So we try to uh, surround ourselves and put proper impressions into our mind. So we go to Mangalarti every day, we see the deity, we hear the Bhagavatam class, we should every day, we hear the Kirtan every day, we try to see pictures of Krishna, we try to fill our mind and senses with impressions that will put us in a consciousness which will move us in the right way. And then we have this competition, right? We go outside and there's billboards all over the place mm -hmm. telling us that we need to look like this and we need to have this thing and we need to wear this clothes and we need to have this kind of boy and we need to have this kind of figure and our hair has to be a certain way, a certain color. And so there's a competition because the material energy is in competition with Krishna. Maya Devi, she's a great devotee. She's not a demon. Sometimes we picture Maya Devi as if she were some, you know, monster. But she's not really a monster. She's Krishna's security force. You know, you have a security guard, and his job is to keep people who are not supposed to get into a place out of the place. And she's supposed to, the security guard's supposed to make sure that when you get in, you don't have any weapons of mass destruction with you, right? So they'll go through your things and check. So Maya Devi, she's meant by Krishna to make sure that no one gets into the spiritual world with any material desire. And she's constantly testing. Oh, so now you don't like cigarettes anymore. Well, how about this? Maybe you like falsigo. Maybe you like fame. Profit? Adoration? Can I offer you some of that? And then maybe you'll go for that now. You're finished with meaning illicit sex and intoxication, maybe you've got that under control. What about profit adoration and distinction? Are you over that? Maybe not. And so that will be the bait. And if you go for it, then you fall down. So we have to be very careful what we allow our senses, what we allow ourselves to get marks in our brain from, right? How many of you have ever had an experience where you go out shopping or something in the material world and you hear a song that you heard when you were maybe 13 years old? And immediately you remember all the words, isn't it? Maybe it comes all day. Even, even you know, I hear some people there chanting the Hindi cinema, Ecto, Tin, Chapunch. So then, then oh, oh, I remember this, this Hindi cinema song. And then it comes back in the mind and it's going all day. It's very hard to turn it off. It's like that someone switched on the tape recorder. But it's been, for me, 50 years since I heard those things. 45, 50 years since I watched the television, since I heard these things. And yet still, if I walk into a shop and they're playing this stuff, I'll remember all the words from when I was a kid. Huh? All the commercials from the television set that I heard about bubble gum and whatever. And because those impressions are still there. And so think, after 50 years, those impressions are still there. So I have to be very careful what I allow to imprint upon my mind. If I'm not careful to watch what I imprint upon my mind, then that thing will come back. What if it comes back at the moment of death? What if the moment of death I start thinking about some Hindi cinema song or some you know, some bubble gum or some whatever that I saw or heard on television, some Thai commercial, some something which I, I, I allowed to make an impression on my mind. And because it, it's 
it's in my mind. Here, Prabhupada calls it tra another transformation. It's a transformation. It actually changes my consciousness. Ramadan Anmaraj, a long time ago, was giving a class, and he said that first it becomes a groove. It's you know every time you know you see pictures of the brain, the brain is full of little grooves. So at first it becomes a groove. When you when you hear something, you learn math, you know the tables, you learn them when you were five, but you still know them. Two, two times two is four, four times two is eight, you know, you know, because there's a groove in your brain where these things are stored. But if you work on those a lot, then it becomes a rut. <laughs> it becomes deeply ingrained in you, and you, you get habits that you can't change. Very difficult to change. We develop bad habits, and then we, can't, we find it very difficult to change. For some people, when we became devotees of Krishna, it was so hard for us to just give up smoking, right? We've been smoking for so long, and then it becomes a habit. Drinking coffee. We were hearing even in our class that some devotees are having trouble giving up coffee. Garlic and onions. Oh my goodness. It's like you think that if it's a choice between going back to God in and having garlic and onions, I'm not sure which I want to do. It may be too hard to give up garlic and onions. I may have to stay in the material world a few more years. Because we get so attached. Our, our habit becomes so strong that we can't, it's very difficult for us to break it. People do all kinds of things. They put the rubber around, band around their wrist, and every time they break, they have a habit, they snap it. It's supposed to help them break a habit. And we, we, so we have to be very careful about what impressions we put in our mind. What, what we allow our senses, there's a combination of control. First, we, you know, we contemplate the objects of the senses, and then we develop attachment to them. And then we decide, okay, I'm going to go for it. And then we can't get it, we get angry. And then we get angry and we get frustrated and we lose our intelligence and we do stupid things. Right? We do stupid things. So stop it at the very beginning. Protect your mind and your intelligence from and your senses from things that you don't want to have them controlled by. Protect them. Don't let them see things. Don't sit and watch the television. Be careful when you're in front of the computer. Because there's so many things that when we're on the computer, we think we're just going to do our email for five minutes. And an hour and a half later, <laughs> we look at the watch and we missed everything because we were there on Facebook or whatever, looking at all the whatever we were looking at. So we have to be very careful, raise our, put our security settings very high so that we don't allow these impressions into our mind, which will create desires. Either, either it, Prabhupada talk, uh, Krishna talks about here, um, you know, Prabhupada talks about either we get determination or we get rejection, but both of them are actually the same. D determination means I'm going to go for it, and rejection means I'm going to go away from it, but either thing is I'm determined to please my senses in one way or another. I'm going to please them by not eating a plant, or I'm going to please them by eating my favorite sabji. One way or another, attraction and aversion are the opposite sides of the same coin. Right? The same coin has heads and tails. It's the same coin. So if we're averted to something, it means that I'm thinking this thing, whatever it is, won't give me pleasure. Therefore, I don't like it. And this other thing, it gives me pleasure, therefore I like it. But the devotee doesn't think like that. The devotee thinks this thing is just a material thing. It has no positive or negative charge. The charge comes from, can I use it to serve Krishna? If I can use it to serve Krishna, then I'll take it. And if I can't use it to serve Krishna, then I'll reject it. Why? I need this thing. It has no value to me whatsoever, unless it can give Krishna pleasure. And if it can give Krishna pleasure, then even if it gives me pain, I'll embrace it. And even if it gives me uh, pleasure, if it gives, if it, Krishna says no, then I'll, I'll reject it. Even if my senses like it, but Krishna's senses don't like it, then I'll give it up. What do I need for it? So this is the motivation that we should look for. And if we can get um, to that level where where accepting and rejecting things according to the desire of Krishna, according to Krishna's pleasure, according 
according to the spiritual master's instruction. Because the spiritual master, he's the one who knows what Krishna likes and what Krishna doesn't like. We may not be so aware. We may think Krishna likes the same, funny how Krishna likes the same things that I like. <laughs> I like pizza, Krishna must love pizza, right? So whatever I think I like, then I'll off, that's what I'm going to give, because Krishna must like everything I like. But when we, we realize that that's not necessarily so, some of the things that we've become habituated to, Krishna doesn't like them at all. And so we should go to the spiritual master and find out from the spiritual master. The great souls, the Mahatmas, we should ask them. There's uh, one verse which is quoted in the Shrimad, uh, which, no, in the, it's, well, it's quoted in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, but it's actually from the Mahabharata. And there's a very famous uh, conversation, I think you probably mostly know it. There's a conversation between Yudhisthira Maharaj at the Lake of Death, and he's talking to Dharmaraj in the form of Yaksha, or some heron. And we know that he asked many questions, and um, Yudhisthira is trying to answer them one after the other. You know about that story? So he's trying to answer the questions one after the other. We all know the last part of the last question when the, the, the Yaksha asks, uh, asks Yudhisthira what is the most wonderful thing, and Yudhisthira answers the most amazing thing and the most wonderful thing is that everybody sees that their relatives and everybody before them is dying, but still they think they're going to live forever. But there's another part of that, that that we don't so much talk about, although Prabhupada uses the verse again and again, and he says, where can we find the truth? Where is the truth hidden? And um, Yudhisthira answers that the truth cannot be found in the Munis, because every Muni, you know, every mental speculator has a different opinion of what the truth is. You ask any five people and they'll all tell you a different truth. Uh, and you can't find the truth in the Shastra either because we don't know how to read the Shastra alone. We don't know how to understand. There's so many things and if you look at the Vedanta Sutra you'll find sutras. How do you know what they mean? They're almost written in riddles. So where do I find the truth? You find the truth Mahajana Yenika that the truth is hidden in the heart of the Mahajan. The Mahajan knows the absolute truth. And if you want to find the absolute truth, you have to take shelter of the Mahajan. The Mahajan will tell you what is best for you, what you should take up, and what you should reject. And so if we're having trouble controlling the mind, if the mind is influenced by passion, when we here we're living in such a difficult situation. I lived in New York for many, many places. New York makes Atlanta look like the country. <laughs> um, so so everybody is battling for your mind. And if you want to be able to control your mind, if you need help, then help is there. Help is there from the association of devotees. Help is there from the, the Shastra. Help is there from the Holy Name. Help is there from uh, the instruction of the spiritual master. And if we take shelter of these things, then we can have success in controlling the mind. The Prabhupada here at the end of the, uh, uh, in, in the purport, he says that it's stated his mind is not fixed in Krishna consciousness, must hoover between acceptance and rejection. So we have to fix our mind, just like the, the have sometimes the bull, and he crushes grains or he um, does some labor by going around in a circle. Um, when he's tied to a pivot. There's a, a pivot, so he can't go anywhere else. It just goes around. And there's a grinding stone, and as he goes around, that stone turns, and the, turn, the, the stone grinds things. So his work is effective because he's fixed in, in, in one place. Even when he plows, he's attached to the plow. So he, he goes forward, and the plow follows, and it, it plows the earth. So if we become fixed, to the order of the spiritual master, to the instructions of the Mahaja, then we can control the mind so that it doesn't pull us by accepting this material thing and rejecting that material thing and dragging us back and forth, back and forth in this remote material nature. And so now it's five after nine. And um, maybe I can take a couple of questions, but I really have to go and prepare for my class. Yes, Hare Krishna. How, Hare Krishna, how can we develop the spiritual intelligence? The spiritual intelligence. Intelligence. Ah, how to develop the spiritual intelligence? Well, how do you develop your muscles? Making <laughs> exercise. Okay. <laughs> right. If we want to develop any muscles, we have to work on them. 
right? By working on our, by using our muscles, then we become they become strong. If we don't exercise, if we don't do anything with them, they become flabby and weak. Um, so our spiritual intelligence, we have to exercise it. We have to do things to make it grow, and we may have to start slowly and then gradually increase. When Prabhupada started the Hare Krishna movement in New York in 1965, the devotees, he would go to the coffee shop. In between his classes, he would go to the coffee shop and he'd find the devotees in the coffee shop. He'd knock on the window, the devotees would hide. <laughs> And, and, and Prabhupada would get them out and bring them and engage them in some service and, you know, give us a class and distribute some prasadam and try to engage us more and more. And then it gradually started hurrying on. He said, okay, you don't have anything to do, go out and, go out and chant. And that's something you can do forever. You know that play, The Genie of the Mind? Have you ever seen that, that little drama? Where, you know, Genie somebody, the model. we pull rubs the lamp, and this genie comes out and says, if you don't engage me, I'll kill you. So, it's like the mind. If you don't engage the mind, then the mind will kill you. So, the, the person who's engaging, he thinks of all different things to do, and the genie finishes it in two seconds and comes back, okay, I finished it. I painted all the leaves in the world gold, now what do you want me to do? On and on, and one after another, and then finally, the, the person thinks, okay, Chant Hare Krishna. Because you can never finish chanting Hare Krishna. You can chant Hare Krishna all day and all night and you'll never get finished. So now the mind can be controlled. So the mind can be controlled by the intelligence that can be developed, exercised by chanting Hare Krishna, by reading the Shastra, by taking association, by staying engaged in devotional service. So if I, I find that I'm chanting Japa but my mind is crazy, I can't, it's very difficult for me to control the mind. Uh, my intelligence is too weak. And so then I have to do some service for a little while. Maybe I have to read some prayers to the Holy Name so that I can remember that why I'm chanting this mantra. I can be in the association of other devotees who are fixed in chanting. And by seeing them chanting, I can become a little, my intelligence wakes up and starts to think, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to control the mind. So um, we have to exercise it. And so, so we have to start small, small sometimes, but by constant practice and detachment, it can be done. Our, Arjuna says it's more difficult to control the mind than the raging wind. And Krishna says, but it can be done. It can be done by constant practice. So the mind, the intelligence, we have to practice bringing the intelligence forward. Sometimes we hear the intelligence and we ignore it. Yes. Right? We ignore it. Instead of ignoring the mind, we ignore the intelligence. And the intelligence tells us, don't do that, don't go there. Um, and because if you go there, it's going to be problematic for you. You have so many old friends there, it's going to give, give, be, give you a hard time. Don't go there at night, it's bad association. But then we don't listen and we do it anyway. So we have to start listening and we have to talk, start maybe making some deal with other devotee that uh, you know, if I, you see me doing something stupid, will you please not let me do it? Right? And then now we have a problem because we have this thing called a phone. We carry it around all the time. I was, I used to, um, when I go to Mayapur, you're chanting Japa and many devotees are chanting Japa. And you can see the cell phones glowing in people's kurta pockets. <laughs> Especially in Vrindavan, when you do morning parikrama. You watch all the cell phones glowing in the boys' korta pockets. <laughs> and you know when the cell, cell phone starts to glow, that means that there's either a call or there's some vibration. And a minute later, that person's walking out like this. His beads are gone, and he's got a phone in his ear. So we have to get rid of those things. We have to put those things away. Not, not, when we want to exercise our intelligence, we have to allow our intelligence to be here. Don't take them when you're chanting Japa. And the mind says, but what if the world, what if something happens and someone has to get in touch with you? What's going to happen? So we listen to the intelligence and we say, no, I'm going to put it there. And then the mind has no power because now it's back there and you're over here. And when you go to say, well, let me get the phone, let me get the mind will say, no, it's too far away. <laughs> so we have to do things um, that will allow our mind to be peaceful and 
allow our intelligence to become strong. And little things, little things, we make decisions, don't eat at night. Right, the intelligence says, it's a big feast, but it's nine o'clock. How are you gonna get up and chant your rounds if you eat this feast now? And the mind and senses are going, eat it, eat it, eat it, it's yummy, look at there's golubjimans, and there's sweet grass, and there's samosa, and there's garanga potatoes, and the intelligence is saying, I'm telling you, if you eat it now, you're going to be sorry later. So you listen, you have to practice listening. Maybe you say, okay, well, I'll just eat a tiny bit of one thing that I like, just so my mind is a little bit satisfied, and my, but I'm following my intelligence. Little by little, you have to develop those muscles. <laughs> so I have to stop because I have to give another class and I have to prepare. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna.